and it is a great pleasure for me to be uh, talking with you all today. I have been collaborating with Samsung over a number of years, and I'll highlight a few of the projects in this presentation. I will not be able to talk about all of them because there have been quite a few, and some of my students have had the pleasure of getting jobs at Samsung as well. So thank you very much for your support. Today, I'll be talking about learning and acceleration in IoT systems. And this work was really uh, motivated by the fact that going forward, computer, uh, computing will really be everywhere, not, uh, on our body, in our environments, um, pretty much all around us. So really the question is, what is the right way to do computing and how do we adapt to continually changing needs of the systems in which we live in? Um, and the only way really to do this is to learn off of the data that's being generated in these distributed environments in a scalable and efficient manner. So some of my earliest uh, work in this area started when I first came to UCSD and joined the project that focused on large-scale environmental sensing. This was a project uh, called HP Wren, headed by Hans Werner Brown and Frank Vernon, uh, and I joined as a co-PI later. Um, the network that was developed over the last 20 years in San Diego County currently covers more than 20,000 square foot mile area. So it basically covers the whole county well beyond toward the desert. And you can see on the map on the left, uh, the high speed point to point links at the top level reach beyond Salton Sea. Uh, they go up to Riverside County and at the edge of Orange County and then down into Mexico. Uh, the links also reach to some of the Channel Islands uh, because we got the special permission from US Navy, in fact, to set up some antennas there. And under every single one of these links, there's literally hundreds of smaller size sensors and data aggregators, each with their own a specific type of connectivity. So this is really a true mesh network that well represents what happens as IoT systems develop over time. Uh, it has high heterogeneity. Many different people are currently using it. Um, the, uh, it ranges from uh, California Fire Department. So a lot of the videos that you have seen on TV from fires in Southern California actually come from our network. Uh, we also, seismic people use it, people who do environmental sensing, uh, police department uses it, and some of the other examples you see here. An example is from California Wolf Center, where they're trying to understand wolf's behavior and trying to also understand wolf's howls. So they use combination of cameras and acoustic sensors. Um, and you also see a cute picture of a student with a directional antenna. This is a student collecting data from uh, ad hoc network uh, down the canyon of uh, the only free flowing river left in Southern California uh, that has been fully instrumented so that we can track uh, how things are developing there. Um, so this high heterogeneity really brings about a multitude of problems with uh, data and data analysis. And it was one of the motivators for us to develop what we call the context engine system that allowed us to run some of the analysis of data on right where the data is created. So on the sensors and on the data aggregators. In the last few years, we have also added to this network some of the mobile components. Um, and this was done through NSF funded project for proactive fire tracking. The idea was that we would want to use a bunch of drones and deploy them in a more remote areas of the county and have them sniff out the beginnings of a forest fire. So this is why you see this video of a drone circling around the barbecue. The goal of the drone is to find the fire when it's barbecue size and to alert somebody. And to do this, we used a combination of air quality sensors, cameras of different types, and we also outfit a drone with ability to do software defined radio because we found that during the big fire events in San Diego County, the network often goes down um, on, uh, especially on the more typical um, frequencies such as 2.4 gigahertz and uh, cell frequency. So using software defined radio allows us to not just sniff out the air quality uh, and a sample of that you can see down below, but also RF spectrum, which you can see on the right-hand side of the picture of the ground. And the issue with all this is that this generates a ton of data, both from the stationary sensors and now from the drones themselves. 
and expecting uh, to send all this data to our campus for computation and then to have system respond in real time is just not realistic, especially during emergency scenarios where the networking may not always work. Um, so this is why the context engine system that we developed was really designed to gather the data, analyze it right on the devices, and provide real-time feedback. Now, obviously, we get higher quality information the more data we can consider when making a decision. So there's a big benefit to providing and having some analysis on the back end. But we also wanted systems that can act uh, and respond correctly uh, even when backend is not available. We also worked with Samsung, and this was a project that completed about a year ago, um, by looking at how the same idea might apply within the smart homes. So for this, we uh, looked at three different applications, all uh, related to smart homes. One was a smart grid application where we instrumented two homes, and we used UCSD's microgrid, uh, which is fully instrumented, so this enabled us to evaluate how well uh, does our tracking using sensors in the home enable us to predict uh, both the energy consumption and energy generation in a home and to then also automatically negotiate with the smart grid system on how much uh, both uh, consumption and generation should be allowed to happen so that the smart grid itself remains stable. The second example that we demonstrated was a healthy aging application where one home was instrumented with the goal of actually tracking uh, cognitive changes in older adults. Um, and this is particularly difficult because cognitive changes are very, very subtle. So you really have to watch for bigger pauses in speech, for a little more uh, consistent habits, so where people uh, tend to not want to change the way they do things over time and so on. So this really then illustrated the strength of having learning within a home instead of uh, having to send the data to the cloud. And then the last uh, setup was a young family uh, where we ins fully instrumented one home and we did an in-person demo um, when the, our collaborators from Samsung came down to San Diego. Um, so uh, this project was really very successful and the in-home demo actually demonstrated the hierarchy of air learning uh, where we used neural network-based models uh, and had those models implemented within our context engines. Um, and instead of doing all of the, inf sending all of the data to the cloud, we actually uh, used all of the data locally to perform inference. And uh, what's interesting here and what's different between this model and federated learning model is that in our model, we use highly heterogeneous data. So different devices will have different types of data and will learn on that data and share the, the summary of their learning with whatever other devices need that summary. And what we found, uh, an example of a activity classification application on Raspberry Pi, is that our hierarchy aware learning had better accuracy and about 70% lower energy cost as compared to the state of the art. And uh, we then generalized this work um, to look at also how to do efficient training on distributed sensors and data aggregators. So now the idea is that not only will we have inference happening uh, locally uh, where the data is gathered, but we'll also adapt and update models uh, using training of neural networks. And for this, we use this concept of active learning, which traditionally was used for reducing labeling costs during training. But here, we actually used it to figure out which are the right informative measurements um, to actually uh, use for the training locally. And we found that with our active learning approach, we could get same accuracy, but reduce the communication cost by up to 80%. So this made it more realistic to in fact do both training and inference on a highly heterogeneous and hierarchical uh, IoT systems. These two uh, examples really showed us a great need for accelerating data analysis uh, in hardware. Because at the end of the day, most of the sensors and data aggregators do not have sufficient computational power or storage to really do a great job at this. 
So this really kind of was a motivator for doing some of the acceleration of data analysis in memory and in storage. And this is some of the key work that we're doing as a part of Jump Crisp Center, which uh, Samsung is sponsoring. So as I said, the key uh, positive issues that have motivated this is uh, that obviously we've noticed that we need to be able to process data inside of memory because most of the performance, in fact, goes to memory transfers. The other advantage in IoT systems is that uh, these applications are not as sensitive to accuracy in general. And that is partly because they are using sensors which are not 100% accurate, which generally have some error rate associated with them to begin with. And then machine learning algorithms themselves uh, typically leverage statistical learning. So there are a number of different solutions that have been proposed to help with this kind of system. One is approximate computing. Uh, which my team has looked at and has implemented by enhancing CPUs, GPUs, DSPs, uh, with the ability to trade off accuracy versus efficiency. And this topic I will not talk about today, but would be happy to cover if you have interest at another time. Um, today I will focus more on the second two uh, approaches on in-memory acceleration and hyperdimensional computing. For in-memory acceleration, the idea is that we would want to do as much computation right in memory where the data resides. And it turns out that there's quite a bit that we can do. We have found uh, efficient ways to do bitwise computations, to do search operations, both exact and nearest search, and also to do addition multiplication, which are the basic operations needed by a lot of data processing algorithms. Um, so I'll show some of the examples in the next few slides of uh, the applications that we have accelerated directly in memory. Um, the other way to accelerate uh, learning is to really rethink how we actually implement learning and to think about uh, strategies that are a little more uh, native to hardware. And hyperdimensional computing turns out is one such strategy because it, it relies on the highly parallel processing of very large vectors of data. Uh, the operations that it uses are very simple, and they're also extremely parallelizable, which is why HD computing is particularly good for IoT systems. And the second part of my talk will fully focus on HD computing. So let me get started with some of the processing and memory applications that we have worked on. Uh, we have looked at many different classes, and I'll just give some examples of each. Um, so we have worked on classification, and I'll give you examples of KNN, AdaBoost, and decision trees in the next few um, slides. We have looked at clustering, uh, both hyperdimensional clustering and k-means. Uh, we have uh, bioinformatics uh, applications accelerated, and I'll show two examples of this. Um, graph processing. Um, we have accelerated, we have about three publications on that, um, and then database. And on database, we actually are collaborating currently with Samsung, um, not directly on PIM, but on FPGA-based acceleration, and I'll touch on that in a second. And so what I would like to do is I would like to start first with query processing. Uh, the in-memory query processing work that we published, I believe, last year um, shows that it is possible to integrate a lot of the basic query operations directly in uh, memory. And actually, we have a system that combines resistive RAM with uh, DRAM in a way that enables us to really run these uh, queries extremely fast. And examples of the types of operations we can do include aggregation, so things like minimum, maximum, average, count the number of queries that satisfy some condition, Bitwise operations, comparisons, prediction, so uh, finding if something exists, uh, searching for something, finding a nearest match, grouping uh, operations, and so on. Addition, and then also join operations, such as inner join, left, right, outer, and so on. Um, so this really shows you that a large majority of frequently used queries, um, in fact, can be accelerated in memory without any problem. The current project we're doing with Samsung is looking at how to accelerate Bitronic sort. And the idea is to use hierarchical FPGA-based Bitronic sort architecture, which would allow us to read data from DRAM and immediately send it to VRAM. Um, 
And my students, uh, jointly with Samsung engineers, designed a template-based design uh, that would allow us to easily scale this. And he was able to create a reconfigurable system which has a number of processing units and processing elements uh, based on available resources and application requirements allocated on the FPGA that would then enable direct data transfers from SSD without having to involve the host. So this would really make it a lot faster. And sure enough, when we uh, implemented this, we found that uh, we could get acceleration of uh, up to about 2000 X as compared to GPU, simply because we're able to skip um, the host while doing the transfers between SSD um, and FPGA. So this gives a great example of joint collaboration. And in fact, the same student will be continuing this work um, over this summer as well, and is currently finishing a paper on this. The other example I wanted to illustrate is Orchard, which was actually object recognition accelerator. Uh, this uh, accelerated object recognition in processing in memory. It has two key components, the feature extraction and uh, boost learner. Uh, each of those has separate uh, style acceleration implemented. For feature extractor, we implemented both hog and har. Uh, extractors in memory and for classification we use the ensemble of decision tree memory blocks and the implementation uh, which used RERAM uh, with VTeam model was about 376 times faster as compared to CPU uh, based recognition at 100% object recognition on four commonly used data sets that you can see below and this paper was published in last year's micro we also accelerated DNA sequence alignment. Uh, we were very motivated to do this, partly because UCSD has a very strong, one of the world's top bioengineering and bioinformatics programs, and we collaborate with faculty in bioinformatics. Um, and we found that the data that bioengineering generates will overtake YouTube and Twitter in just a few years from now. We're talking five years from today. Um, and right now, most of the drug development and uh, detection of diseases is uh, uh, slow because of the slowness of computation. So the idea was in our design to use digital processing and memory design for alignment. Uh, in our system, we separate reference matching and computation of the form. And we also exploit compute-enabled H3 interconnect data transfers. And as you can see, our design is about 200 times faster as compared to NVIDIA um, GPU implementation. We also compared it to CUDA Align, and we were, I believe, about 200 times faster than about 280 GPU cores that CUDA Align was using. We also accelerated uh, nearest neighbor search uh, in processing in memory. And you can see that this is done by putting uh, accelerator memory right next to DRAM and integrating the two systems together. And in fact, we have another paper that uh, addresses the question of how do you decide what data to put in special accelerator memory versus what sh which data should remain in DRAM. And in this example, we found that uh, we were about 500 times faster uh, than GPU implementation of the same accelerator. We have also done work on accelerating deep neural networks from both perspective of training and inference. And our last year's paper at ISCA uh, showed that we can actually accelerate floating point uh, DNN training and inference in memory. One thing that I wanted to really impress on you with DNNs, people usually think about uh, you know, how great it is that DNNs are able to deliver these amazing results, but you have to remember that their performance is also heavily reliant on hyperparameter tuning. And there are quite a few of those parameters, and sometimes it is not very obvious uh, what is the right setting to get the good results. They also require multi-epoch training for every hyperparameter combination. So the process of getting quality result is actually fairly slow and complex. And with deep neural networks, we generally don't know if there is an error, why exactly that error occurred. 
so in our example, for both training and for inference, we map a layer of nor neural network to a particular block um, in memory. So you can see color coordinated here, uh, how we uh, laid out blue layer into a blue block, yellow layer, yellow block, green layer into green, and gray layer into the gray area of memory. And then inside of each of these uh, components, we actually provide specialized switches that enable much more efficient data transfer between the uh, neural network layers. And then when you look at inside of each layer, we, uh, we really looked at what is the right way to lay out uh, the data itself so that we can leverage in memory processing. Um, so for when we do both training and inference, we find that we're much faster. Uh, so our implementation is about 300 times faster when using floating point as compared to GPU. And compared to pipe layer, which was the state of the art at that time, we're about four times faster, but we're also much more accurate because uh, pipe layer actually does integer, whereas we can do floating point. And you can see on the results that pretty consistently we're way quicker than uh, anything else in the market. So given all this, you can see that uh, for many of today's data sets, it would be very reasonable uh, to expect that we could get good performance uh, for analyzing that data directly in memory. And this what might make hierarchical learning of the style that I described at the beginning of my talk very much a reality. Uh, and where the idea of training deep neural networks in such heterogeneous sy system is not that unreasonable, in fact. However, there is a better way for many of these applications, and that is to really think about how human brain handles the sensor data input. So here's an example of what happens when the sensing data comes uh, through human eye. Uh, it looks actually initially very dense. It's a signal that has about equivalence of 1 million pixels. But when it's actually analyzed in the brain, uh, the data is represented using uh, much larger uh, data sets that are at least 200 times bigger. So it seems clear that this dense sensor input is hierarchically mapped into something that's high dimensional and sparse. So the question is, is there a good reason why biology chose a sparse representation for data analysis? And one of the thoughts that the uh, computer science theorists have is that um, Sparsity, in fact, uh, can help by taking more dense and highly nonlinear data in lower dimensionality. And when you explode it out to higher dimensionality in the right way, you might be able to get much more linear and therefore much more easily to operate uh, system representation. And that is kind of what hyperdimensional computing does. It takes original data, which say might be 64-bit floating point values, it encodes it using nonlinear encoding, and it's going to encode it into 10,000 bit size vectors, so really large hypervectors. Uh, it uses very basic operations during encoding. Uh, it uses addition and it uses permutation, where permutation is basically rotating or shifting bits around. Um, then we perform training, which is a linear operation, and it's actually super easy. For training in hyperdimensional computing, all you have to do is add a bunch of hypervectors together to get a representation of a particular class, for example. Um, so it is a much faster operation as compared to deep neural networks. And then the last piece is associative search which would be either ve vector matrix multiplication um, or it might be analog search or if you're using fully binary implementation you can also just do a count for Hamming distance and here you're just looking at what is the closest match now because we're using these very large vectors uh, we know that we can actually uh, usually find a match pretty easily because the distance between the two closest random numbers in 10,000 bit space is very large. Um, so finally, when we're done with search, we would identify what is the closest result and that would actually complete um, the whole system. So in hyperdimensional computing, the slow part actually is the encoding. Uh, both training and inference are super fast. And so for encoding, we would generate a random number uh, 
that represents a query in this example query hypervector. And then we will do a similarity check. But part of the encoding is trying to figure out uh, how to actually encode a particular piece of data. So here for images, and this is an example from MNIST, we use two different components. We use the position vector, which tells us where the pixel is located. And we also use the level vector, which just tells us what, uh, what is the color at that particular location. For each position ID and level vector ID, we use a different random number. So as I move through an image, uh, different random numbers will be used, for example, for different pixel locations. But between different images, same pixel location will have the same random number. So effectively, creating um, an encoding for a particular piece of data would involve combining all of the ID uh, hypervectors with level hypervectors uh, for a particular, in this example, pixel location, and then summing all of the pixels together to represent the whole image. You can do exactly the same thing for other types of data. Uh, for example, if you have DNA data, you have essentially just four letters to encode, and then you're combining them into a system as a function of where those letters are located at in the DNA sequence. So the key thing here is that we are using long vectors, so 10,000 bits is pretty typical. We're using very simple operations. They're super easy to accelerate in hardware. And on top of that, these operations are bitwise independent. So it's very easy to get high parallelism. So here, here is a little more detailed example of how classification might work. So we would go start with a set of images, in this example, cat images and dog images. All of them would be encoded. And for cat images, combined into a cat hypervector. For dog images, they might be combined into a dog hypervector. The encoding might be binary or non-binary. You can also encode metadata in. So for example, if I want to know when these pictures were taken, I can encode that as part of it. I can also encode streaming data. An example would be from my sensor network, where I continually sample various uh, sensing streams. I can very easily encode that as I'm sampling. Then the next part is training, and here, Training can be as simple as single paths, where I simply add up hypervectors that represent cats together. And that then becomes my single cat hypervector representation. I can also adjust and adapt uh, online, because if I find, for example, that I have accidentally uh, added a dog image into my cat hypervector representation, it's very easy to fix that. I just subtract the wrong image encoding and I, from the cat hypervector, and then I add it to the dog hypervector, and that solves the problem. During testing, I perform exactly the same encoding. The only difference is, is that now I run a similarity check where I look for the closest match between, in this case, my combination of zeros and ones to whatever I have stored in my uh, training data set. So, this basically illustrates to you how simple it is, in fact, to do both training and inference in hyperdimensional computing. As I mentioned earlier, it is pretty easy to do adaptive learning. So here, if we have query and we check if we're using binary data for Hamming distance and we find that the match was incorrect, all we do is we subtract from the incorrect class and we add it back to the correct class. And that basically fixes our model. The other strength of HD computing is that I can interpret uh, my results. So if something wrong happens, I can ask a question of why did this happen? And I can precisely discover where things went wrong. In addition to that, I can also recover the data. So if I want to uh, get a particular cat out of my cat hypervector, I can in fact do that. And I can also get all of the me metadata out. And I do this using an iterative process which we recently published, where basically we use the knowledge of all the base hypervectors that were used to create an encoding. And then uh, we use uh, uh, the fact that multiplying with the known base vector will allow us to actually isolate each component in turn of the original piece of data. And as we iterate on this, we can get the original data out. 
So there are many applications that have benefited from HD computing um, because the HD computing is so energy efficient. It has this large dimensionality, which means that it is reversible and interpretable. Um, it relies on statistical analysis, which makes it super robust. In fact, I'll show you in a second that in inference, we can lose as much as half of the bits and we still get correct results. It has ultra fast and single pass training. It leverages a relatively well defined algebra and set of operations, and it does support secure and real time learning and reasoning. And you can see from this list of applications, and this is not a complete list, that we have actually tested HD computing on many applications, and generally we get uh, results that are just as accurate as state of the art algorithms, but that are a lot more efficient. And when it comes to robustness, we find that as long as we have hypervectors that have at least 2,000 bits, the accuracy is basically unaffected, even if up to 50% of the bits are corrupted. And in fact, for some of the recent tests, we found that we can push this even up to 80%. It depends a little bit on the size of vector. The training is much faster than for DNNs, and you can see from this log plot that HD computing achieves pretty much full accuracy within a few uh, training cycles, whereas DNN will take a, at least 100 epochs before achieving um, convergence. So training in HD is almost instant compared to deep neural networks. And when it comes to accuracy, and this is an example comparing classification, reinforcement learning, and regression, you can find that uh, we're generally within less than 1% difference between HD computing and DNNs, and most of the time, uh, just about exactly the same. So I'd like to next give you some examples that we implemented in HD computing. And then after that, I'll show you some how we designed the hardware accelerators. We are currently in the process of creating a library that would be a lot like TensorFlow library, except it would focus on HD and would allow you to run HD code on CPU, GPU, FPGA, and processing and memory implementation. So without further ado, one of the first applications I wanted to point to is classification, but instead of going with some boring classification that most people have worked on, we decided to also look at something a little more different, where we try to classify microbiome. So we basically looked at, can we classify bacteria um, that uh, might be relevant for human health? And for training, uh, we encoded each DNA alphabet into a hypervector, and then uh, we combined uh, those uh, hypervectors together to create uh, genomes for a particular bacteria, and that would represent the class of bacteria. For inference, uh, we just did the encoding and then did near research. And what we found is that our results were had equal accuracy to the state-of-the-art algorithms, but we were about 1,000 times faster than the best implementation on CPU and about 100 times faster uh, when implemented in memory as compared to using hyperdimensional computing implementation on G GPU for the same uh, type of classification. We also did DNA pattern matching, which is the basis of sequence alignment, which is then the basis of pretty much all of the algorithms in bioinformatics. The idea is that we would encode DNA sequences into hypervectors and then find the closest match. Um, and what we found, and you can see down below, that uh, we would have a reference sequence. So, for example, human reference sequence uh, is about 3 billion uh, base pairs. Um, and the nice thing about reference sequences is it changes very rarely. So, for humans, it changes once every 10 years. Uh, the query sequence is generally much shorter. It's about 100 to 200 base pairs because that's what uh, today's shotgun sequencers actually provide as output. And then we uh, create an uh, encoded reference and encoded queries. And all we need to do is find whether queries exist in the reference, which is basically using a nearest search. And you can see here that as compared to state of the art, which is Bowtie, um, Bowtie is used by a lot of teams because of its high accuracy and very easy trade-off between speed and accuracy. 
And you can see that we're about 44 times faster on FPGA implementation and about 122 times faster as compared to running on GPU. And in fact, in uh, DNA alignment, uh, we have gone a step further and we compared our design with um, state-of-the-art Dragon Board, uh, which was uh, actually bought out by Lumina in 2018 for $100 million. We are currently seven and a half times faster, uh, sorry, Dragon is currently seven and a half times faster than uh, Minimap running on CPU. And Minimap is actually currently the fastest implementation of alignment on CPU. It is faster than Bowtie 2. Uh, Genie HD, which is our implementation that I just showed you, is about 200 times faster as compared to CPU implementation. And Rapid, which I showed you a little earlier, uh, is about 250 times faster as compared to Dragon. So this means that we go from hours to seconds for human DNA alignment, which is really critical when we're trying to uh, deal with uh, key issues that are relevant to human health. Another example of an application is clustering that uh, we can do using HD computing. And the idea here is, again, you would encode all of the data in hyperdimensional space, but you would go through first uh, step of figuring out what would be a good initial clusters using some simple initial cluster generator. And then as we get uh, more data, we would want to continue clustering until some threshold of error is met. Um, and at that point, we would be able to actually uh, report out what are the right cluster centers for all of the clusters that we've identified. And this actually turns out works just as well as state-of-the-art clustering algorithms. Recommendation systems uh, are also fairly straightforward for HD computing. For recommendation systems, we would encode the, the item hypervector and the reading hypervector. And then depending on what question we're uh, interested in, we would combine these hypervectors into different classes. And the search essentially is, again, nearest distance search that we have done for also classification and clustering. Um, for regression, uh, is slightly different because in regression, we have continuous variables coming in. So we're doing continuous encoding. And uh, so the real challenge here is having fast enough encoding process. But this is something that we're currently working on uh, doing uh, directly in storage. So the idea is that we would actually do some of the encoding in flash instead of waiting for processing in memory. And this could dramatically speed up the overall system. And then we perform function training with boosting, and that gives us our model hypervectors that would represent uh, well the regression uh, for a particular function. And that then, in turn, allows us to implement reinforcement learning and hyperdimensional computing, where the idea is to incrementally train the hyperdimensional computing action model and to that allows us then to choose proper actions that will maximize rewards given whatever state we're at. And for this, we use the standard softmax activation. Um, so you can see that there is, in fact, a lot of different ways that you, uh, HD computing can be leveraged um, uh, and where we can actually get very good results. And the last thing that we published at the end of last year was doing secure distributed learning. And this is something that could be pretty easily implemented on hierarchical uh, IoT networks, such as the ones I showed you at the beginning of my talk. And there are many different ways to do learning. The way most people do today is uh, centralized, where you would essentially take the data and send it to the cloud, cloud does the learning, and then you use the model locally. In this example, if we use uh, HD learning that is secure, we would have hypervectors generated, but those hypervectors would be combined with uh, encoding key, the crypto key that allows the hypervector to be uh, secure. And then that you would send to the cloud. The problem is that those uh, data now has become a lot bigger than classical data. So a better way would be to send pre-trained hypervectors for a single data type instead of actually sending all of the data itself. And we could do that still in a very secure way by simply adding a crypto key on top of the hypervector. 
But by far the best way would be to do the distributed learning using different data types and to combine those hypervectors to aggregate the information locally. So that way the cloud really doesn't have to know almost anything about the data. It just needs to know what it needs to combine from different uh, types of sensors to produce a result that's of interest uh, at the back end. And we then compared this system with homomorphic encryption and we found that our encoding was about 145 times faster and decoding was almost seven times faster as compared to the Microsoft SEAL implementation. So I think I by now gave you pretty good uh, idea of the uh, types of applications that we have tested and that can work fairly well with HD computing. What I would like to do next is tell you a little bit more about how we have accelerated this in hardware. Um, so we have worked on libraries for CPUs and GPUs uh, that are specific to HD computing. What I would like to show you in the next few slides is our implementation on FPGA and on PIN. So our FPGA, we actually created an automated system that can take hand-optimized templates and a specification at a fairly high level that tells us what is the application, what are the trade-offs on accuracy, performance, power, and what is the size of different FPGAs that we have available. And then our system can automatically generate the model and then also do the scheduling, uh, ensure that training, retraining, and inference happen correctly, and just map it directly onto the FPGA. And the results that we see as compared to the baseline FPGA implementation is that we can get about six times more energy efficiency and we can be five times faster by uh, simply using automated template-based implementation as compared to writing HD code in RTL and relying on the synthesis system to do all of the work for us. On GPU, we find that we're about 900 times more energy efficient. And you can see that that's fairly consistent across uh, all of the different applications we tested. By far the best way to do HD computing would be to do it in memory or in storage. Um, so the idea is, in our case, is to use digital processing in memory where we can implement many basic operations such as bitwise operations, addition, multiplication, and search. And this means that we can work on digital data so we don't need A to D, D to A conversion. Uh, we elimin eliminate all the data movements. We can use the parallelism and we can implement fixed or floating point operations. And you saw earlier that we're able to do floating point training and inference for neural networks. So that's something that we could very easily do for HD computing. So when we look at PIM operations, we can easily do row parallel addition or multiplication. And we can do exact search, nearest distance search, Hamming distance search, and um, directly Hamming computing. Uh, which means that for HD encoding, it's pretty simple to combine level hypervectors and the uh, location, for example, hypervectors together, uh, both using uh, row-based addition, but also using uh, permutation, which is another basic operation in HD computing. Permutation just swaps the bits around. So this is an example of formatation. And then once we're done, we can store the data back in the memory. And that means that we now have encoded data. With encoded data, the training and learning is super easy because we just combine a bunch of it uh, using, for example, row-based addition to create a class. For digital search, we can do it using Hamming distance if the data is all binary. So the simplest thing is to use a bunch of XOR gates and then count whoever has the um, most matches would be the, the closest uh, result. However, it turns out that uh, hyperdimensional computing is super robust, so we actually don't need exact search. And we found that the most similar classes might have as many as 50 bits mismatch. So that means that we may be able to get away with analog approximate search. So if we're doing exact search, uh, we want to pre-charge the lines once before the search, do the matching, and then we discover after we're done that in fact uh, we can get uh, whatever is the exact match. And in this case, it's a class two that gives the exact match. 
Now, in this example, about 90% of energy will be consumed in XOR array, which is really a lot of energy. So instead, uh, what we might do is we might monitor the speed of the discharge. And because faster discharge means more mismatch, what, what we need to look for is the slowest possible discharge. Um, so that's one of the motivations behind the nearest search, where we actually use a current mirror and the loser take all uh, current comparator to figure out what is a row with a minimum current. And this leads then to multi-stage analog search, which allows us uh, to kind of isolate uh, chunks of 10,000 bits, because otherwise uh, it would be really difficult to get a good enough single stage sense amplifier for all of those bits. So instead, we actually do it in multiple stages. And this allows us to give uh, really good accuracy with uh, much lower uh, LTA precision. Um, so for analog search, we found that 13-bit LTA is about 17 times more efficient than 16-bit. But we ended up using the 16-bit LTA blocks because we simply wanted to make sure that we get 43-bit minimum distance, which is the worst case that we found among all of the classes and all of the data sets that we used. So this is our experimental setup. We used VPM, NVM model. Uh, for CMOS, we used 28 nanometer. Uh, HSPICE was used for netlists to get some delay and energy estimates. And the tools we used was System Verilog and Synopsys Design Compiler. And what we found is that our analog design is as accurate and uh, much faster. I mean, up to about almost 400 times faster than GPU and 14 times faster than digital design. And that, in fact, when we implement hyperdimensional computing on PIM, as compared to FPGA and GPU, we can be as much as 100 times faster at about the same accuracy level. Um, and relatively recently, there has been also a HD classification accelerator chip uh, that was designed in collaboration between Stanford and Berkeley. And that showed that, in fact, our analog PIM design is super efficient and it's about almost six orders of magnitude uh, in terms of energy delays compared to CPU. So you can see from these examples that the needs for intelligent memory and storage systems are very large since there are many data sets that are very bound by memory accesses. And I've shown you that we've been able to accelerate many of these applications in memory. We also saw that HD computing is very uh, attractive and promising solution. Uh, for future computing systems because it's very robust, it can learn adaptively, which makes it very good for IoT devices, and it very elegantly handles big data by simply combining data into larger classes. Um, so this gives you a pretty good idea that HD computing combined with processing in memory and maybe processing in storage is a good idea. Some of the other projects that my team works on are energy and thermal management and actually had an older project with Samsung focused on that with specific application to mobile systems. Um, on individual systems, uh, we are doing a lot of work on acceleration of bioinformatics workloads. We have done energy, thermal, reliability, power, and cooling management for mobiles and data center systems. And on networks of systems, we have done energy management in data centers, green energy modeling and management, uh, we have looked at distributed sensing and control in smart cities, uh, distributed drone control and management, and then I have a current funded project by SRC uh, for IoT system reliability and maintainability, which was motivated by the fact that in IoT systems, up as much as 80% of cost goes to actually maintainability issues. <clears throat> 